All right, good afternoon. Um, just starting off with this morning, uh, as you saw, the Secretary General spoke at the Security Council's virtual open meeting, uh, open debate on peace and security in Africa. One year into the COVID-19 pandemic, he said it is clear that the crisis is feeding many drivers of conflict and instability. But he added that recovery from the pandemic offers an opportunity to address the root causes of the conflict, put prevention in the forefront of our efforts, and implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the African Union Agenda 2063. African governments themselves, he said, have shown great commitment to fight the pandemic by establishing the Africa Task Force for a unified continent-wide approach. However, limited uh, supply and access to vaccines, as well as insufficient support for the pandemic response, are delaying the recovery. The Secretary General renewed his call for an equitable and sustainable vaccine rollout worldwide. He also reiterated his appeal for measures to alleviate the debt burden that threatens to cripple the recovery in many low- and middle-income developing countries, particularly in Africa. His remarks were shared with you. <clears throat> Turning to the situation in Israel and uh, Gaza and the occupied Palestinian territory. In a flash appeal, the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, said today it urgently seeks $38 million to respond to the immediate needs and to carry out essential emergency interventions in Gaza. UNRWA said the activities cover an initial 30-day emergency response from the start of the escalation on May 10th and will support up to 50,000 individuals seeking safety in about 50 designated emergency shelters. Regarding funding, Mark Lowcock, the emergency relief coordinator, uh, said that uh, the UN's humanitarian coordinator on the ground, Lynn Hastings, hopes to release $14 million from the uh, humanitarian fund for the occupied Palestinian territory. The emergency relief coordinator called upon donors to accelerate their contributions to the fund without delay. He added that the crossings uh, with Gaza need to be opened for the entrance of essential humanitarian supplies, including fuel and basic services and supplies to help cur curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And the Secretary General, for his part, said that we are seeing immense human suffering and extensive damage to homes and vital infrastructure in Gaza. He called on the international community to ensure adequate funding for our humanitarian operations there. And as a reminder, the Secretary General will address the General Assembly uh, tomorrow in the special session uh, on the situation in the occupied Palestinian territory. We will share his remarks with you under embargo as soon as we get them. Uh, moving on to Mali, uh, just want to highlight a joint communique issued by the UN mission, the African Union, and ECOWAS, that's the Economic Community of West African States. Uh, they met uh, as members of the local committee to monitor the transition and init uh, initiated consultations to facilitate the successful conclusion of the transition. In the communique, the com uh, committee members took note of the decision by the president of the, transitional, the transition, Ba Ndao, to reappoint Prime Minister Mokhtar I to his functions. They reiterated their strong support for the leaders of the transition and encouraged them to persevere in their efforts to ensure a transition that is as inclusive as possible, balanced and based on respect for the principles of good governance. The committee also underlined the need to respect the agreed transition timetable. The committee members also reiterated their appeal to all stakeholders to spare no efforts to meet the challenges facing Mali and to place the interest of Mali and its people above all other considerations. And uh, staying in the region, in Niger, the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is telling us that in the western region of Tilaberi, more than 10,000 men, women, and children have fled their homes since last Friday. This follows violent attacks by non-state armed groups on the uh, Anzuru district near the border with Mali. The registration of displaced people and the provision of food, education, water, and sanitation hygiene is ongoing. And as you're aware, in recent months, those regions of Tilaberi and Tahua along the borders with Mali and Burkina Faso have experienced es escalating cross-border attacks. The number of internally displaced persons in Tilaberi has nearly doubled over the past year and a half from 50,000 in 57,000 in December 2019 to 102,000 this year in May. And across Niger, 2.3 million people are likely to be severely food insecure during this year's lean season because of insecurity, drought, and floods. About 3.8 million people need humanitarian assistance in the country, 
Aid agencies seek $523 million to help the most vulnerable 2.1 million people. So far, only 7% of the required funding has been received. And turning to Syria, the Secretary General's third report on children in armed conflict in Syria is out today. It shows that more than 2,700 children were killed or maimed between July 8, 2018 and June 2020 by airstrikes, explosive remnants of war, and indiscriminate ground shelling of civilian populated area. Meanwhile, more than 1,400 children were recruited or used by at least 25 parties to the conflict. The report covers a two-year period which witnessed the outbreak of the pandemic and imposition of related restrictions out of March of this year. Uh, last year, excuse me, and the actual number of grave violations is therefore believed to be higher than the 4,724 that are verified in the report. The report also highlights the emerging trend of transnational recruitment in which children were recruited and trained in Syria before being trafficked to Libya to participate in hostilities by armed groups. And in uh, Lebanon, the International Support Group for Lebanon, which includes the UN, and uh, other international partners met in uh, Beirut today to take stock of the situation in the country. In a statement issued afterwards, the group's members lamented the ongoing political stalemate that the government uh, formation process. The International Support Group once more called on Lebanon's leaders to set aside their differences in national interest and to delay no further the formation of a fully empowered government capable of meeting the country's urgent needs and implementing long overdue reforms. The International Support Group has also called for elections to take place on time to preserve Lebanon's democracy in the context of the ongoing crisis. It urged all relevant Lebanese authorities to initiate timely preparation in accordance with the electoral calendar. And turning to Myanmar, our colleagues there are still gravely concerned over rising levels of displacement since the military takeover of the government on February 1st. Since then, as you know, there's been widespread violence against civilians across the country, clashes between the Myanmar armed forces and ethnic armed organizations in border areas has intensified. UNHCR said in Myanmar that as, as of last week, approximately 60,700 women, children, and men have been internally displaced. More than 1,700 refugees crossed into Thailand in March and April, most of whom subsequently returned to Myanmar, and an estimated 4,000 to 6,000 have sought safety in India. The UN team in Myanmar called on all countries across the region to offer refuge and protection to all to, uh, people coming, uh, seeking safety. While humanitarian workers should be granted access to help them, our colleagues again call on the military to refrain from violence and the use of disproportionate use, including the use of live ammunition. Quick note from Geneva, where the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, today announced the appointment of three high-level uh, high experts to the UN Human Rights Office's fact-finding mission on Belarus. They will assist the High Commissioner in conducting a comprehensive examination of alleged human rights violations committed in Belarus since May 1, 2020, including the possible gender dimensions of such violations. Um, and an update on COVID from Bangladesh, where our UN team there has led, led by our resident coordinator, Mia Seppo, is helping to address the multiple impacts of the pandemic. We have stepped up our efforts in the area of risk communications, community engagement, and supplying oxygen. Since last June, our team has trained more than 1,400 local community health workers. We've also helped to visit 2.2 more, it says 2.2 households. I assume that's more than 2.2 households. Uh, we've helped to uh, visit a lot of households and screen some 280,000 people from COVID-19. Our colleagues are also distributing locally produced masks. Uh, the UN team brought together hundreds of people from the government, private sector, civil society, and other design implement and, other, and others to design, implement, and monitor a collective plan of action to respond to the pandemic. Through this approach, more than 50 million people have been engaged in spreading messages on how to prevent the spread of the virus. Also, half a million Muslim leaders have helped to disseminate messages in nearly 240,000 mosques around Bangladesh. And on a related note, a report today released by UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, shows that world trade recovery from COVID-19 crisis hit a record high in the first quarter of 2021 increasing by 10% year-over-year and 4% quarter-over-quarter. 
According to the global trade update, trading goods during the first quarter of 2021 was higher than the pre-pandemic level, but trade in services remained substantially below average. The report notes that the impressive rebound continued to be driven by strong export performance of East Asian economies, whose early success in the pandemic mitig uh, mitigation allowed them to rebound faster and to capitalize on booming global demand for COVID-19 related products. The global trade update pointed out that trade will continue growing in 2021 with the overall forecast indicating an increase of about 16% from the lowest point of 2020. And just uh, two more notes. Um, a report released today by the UN Environment Program and its partners says that while countries have made progress towards a global target on the number of protected areas, it is failing short on commitment on the quality of these areas. Today, 16.6% of all inland of all and inland water ecosystems and 7.7% of coastal waters and the ocean are within documented, protected and conserved area. This puts countries on track to exceed the 17% tar target set by countries 10 years ago. However, UNEP says that just des designating these areas is insufficient and stress that they need to be actively managed and equitably governed to realize many benefits. The report also calls for existing protected and conserved areas to be intensified, identified and recognized by accounting for the effort of indigenous peoples, local communities and private entities while recognizing their rights and responsibilities. More information online. And lastly, tomorrow I will be joined by uh, Elliot Harris, uh, the UN's chief economist, along with uh, Nazrul Islam, the lead author of the World Social Report 2021, which is produced by our colleagues in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Ms. Lederer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steph. Um, does the Secretary General have any comment on President Biden's call to Prime Minister Netanyahu to significantly uh, de-escalate the situation in Gaza and Netanyahu's recent comment uh, saying that he's determined to press ahead? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to comment on those comments. What I will say is what we said what our position is, is that we want to see a stop to the fighting as soon as possible. We want to see a stop of the fighting immediately. Um, there needs to be a halt uh, to the aerial attacks, to the rockets, to the uh, artillery strikes going from one side uh, to the other. Civilians need to be able to live in peace. We need to get that humanitarian aid uh, into, into Gaza. Uh, for our part, um, our special coordinator, Tor Venislan, is actively engaged uh, with all sides on the ground in order to work uh, towards that end. Uh, Big two, and then we'll go to James. Steph, my question on DSG's report on children uh, in armed conflict in Syria. Does this report detail how many children uh, have been trained and uh, sent to Libya and how were they sent and yeah, who I mean, were I training them? Uh, do you have any more details or does the report you know, have all those details? I think both you and I need to read the report fully. No, I, I say this, I, I just got the note. I haven't looked. I mean, the report, as usual, is full of, of data and well-researched, so I would just... Um, would you happen to know how many children? No, I don't, but it's, 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 it should be in, in the report, which is public. Mr. Bayes, welcome back. Thank you. A um, couple of questions on the situation in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. France has come up with a draft Security Council resolution. How important does the Secretary General believe it is that the Security Council now speaks with one voice? Very. Uh, we think a, a unified and strong voice uh, from the Security Council actually carries weight, uh, not only in this situation, but in, in other situations of, uh, of conflict. What we're seeing on the ground, does the Secretary General believe these are war crimes? Our focus right now is on uh, on seeing an immediate uh, cessation of, uh, of hostilities. Uh, I think that will be to for all for others and and for different parts of the UN to look at afterwards. 
And what's the Secretary General himself been doing? You've talked about what yeah. Mr Wenesland is doing. I remember covering in 2009 when there was a similar conflict, mm -hmm. Ban Ki-moon got on a plane mm -hmm. and he went to Tel Aviv and, 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 and he raised issues with the Israeli mm -hmm. government at the time. Does the Secretary General feel he should perhaps follow the example of his predecessor? You know, each Secretary General has his own uh, methods of, uh, of engaging uh, in these in these uh, in these types of uh, of events, and uh, you know, we will let uh, historians look, compare and contrast 2009 to 2014 to 2021. Um, the Secretary General has been fully engaged and following it very closely. He's raised this issue with uh, in contacts with the Russians, uh, with the Americans, uh, with, the, uh, with the King of Jordan, with the Palestinians, uh, with, uh, with Israelis uh, soon. Uh, but he has really empowered uh, his man on the ground, uh, Tor Venesland, uh, to engage in very, very active uh, diplomacy in order to bring about uh, an immediate cessation of hostilities. Sorry, a very quick follow-up, because you said with the Israelis soon. Yes, Are you be... saying that the Secretary General, in all of this period of bombardment by Israel and rockets from Gaza, has not spoken to the Israeli Prime Minister? There's been no direct contact with the Secretary General and Mr Netanyahu. The, Why not? Because the, 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 it is, we are doing what we feel would be uh, the most efficient. Uh, in order to get to where we are. And that is the, the diplomacy uh, on the ground, the contacts that are being had on the ground. Uh, Beitul. So just a follow up on James' question. Um, uh, we were told that the US does not support the French initiative to circulate this draft resolution. What is your reaction? There is obviously I, I no mean, I, I, unity in the Security no, Council. No, th 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 the fact that there is no unity is a fact. The fact that we would like to see unity is our position. Um, the, the, the Council uh, is the master of its domain. The Council members will, will debate and they will act uh, accordingly. I mean, I, we can't tell them what to do. We can, we've expressed what we would like to see. Uh, but Celia. Uh, to a follow-up on James and Betul questions. <laughs> uh, do you really think that the Secretary General is doing enough to stop that war? Because Kofi Annan it, itself went in 1998 to Iraq and stopped the war that was coming. So is he doing enough? Uh, listen, I, I'm not going to uh, compare the situation idea in Iraq to this current uh, situation. Uh, the Secretary General has a very specific uh, approach. Uh, it is not one uh, that involves uh, very public diplomacy. That's his, his approach. Uh, I can tell you that he is in daily, multiple times contact with, uh, with Tor uh, Venislan, uh, who is uh, engaged in, uh, in very, very active and deep contacts uh, on all sides, trying to get to where we want to be. Yes, sir. Hi, Stefan. Uh, it looks like there will be a number of foreign ministers tomorrow mm -hmm. attending the uh, special session of the UNGA. Uh, does it mean uh, that in September we will see a better presence comparing to last year? I don't know. Uh, we're obviously, we, as you know, we will be bringing to member, uh, to member states various options uh, on, on the reopening. Uh, there's going to be a meeting this afternoon uh, with the General Assembly. Um, the member states will have to make some decisions, uh, obviously taking into account the current situation in um, the current situation on the ground in, uh, in New York State, uh, what in, in the U.S. So. Uh, but the Secretary General will have a number of bilateral meetings with the foreign ministers tomorrow morning before the, before the meeting. Uh, I'll start working on my song and dance routine. Uh, Celia. Um, thank you, Stefan. Um, so if the efforts on the ground, as you mentioned, that's the strategy right now is to work from the ground mm -hmm. and try to approach the government of Israel. If that doesn't work, do you have a time frame in terms of maybe when the Secretary General maybe have a call or decides? Look, the, the, 
things are being d decided on a, on a day to day basis. Uh, what what is the best tactic in the Secretary General's mind to try to bring an end, uh, trying to bring an end to this uh, to this conflict? His position publicly is very clear and has been well uh, well documented. Just a follow up: a ceasefire. Uh, you, you, the efforts are advancing. What is um, the new approach? We know that France expressed that um, President Macron said that he had been talking to the parts. Um, um, the leaders of Palestine, mm -hmm. as well as the Israel, the president of the United States, as uh, Edith mentioned, um, had a call. Um, where that stands, what the countries are, um, uh, is anything that the secretary is coordinating? Well, I mean, there are obviously discussions going on between uh, between governments as well. I mean, we know uh, there are other parties uh, involved in trying to get uh, to bring peace and to see a halt to the fighting. I think everybody is working in the same in the same direction. Celia, and then we'll go to the screen. Uh, regarding those uh, foreign ministers that are, who are coming uh, tomorrow, will they get tested? I guess they won't go on quarantine. Uh, I think that's an issue between them and the host, uh, the host authorities, the host country. Um, OK, uh, Toby, and then Maggie, and then Abdelhamid. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Steph. I have two questions today, one on Israel-Palestine and the other on uh, Myanmar. On Israel-Palestine, uh, we, we saw normalizations of diplomatic relations um, within the past year between Israel and uh, several other countries in the region, and now we're seeing some of the worst violence uh, between Palestinians and Israelis that we've seen in years. Um, does the Secretary General feel that uh, any of these normalizations were were damaging to the the dynamics uh, in the region. I, I'm not. That's that's an analysis best left to to you, Toby. I'm I, I'm not equipped uh, to do that kind of uh, uh, to do that kind of spot analysis. If you'll if you'll excuse me. Um, okay, that's fair. Uh, my question on Myanmar then is, uh, is look, it's been almost three months, a quarter of a year since uh, February 1st, since the coup. And we haven't heard very much recently from Ms. Schrock-Bertner at all. Is she still viewing the situation as dynamic or has it calcified into a new political scenario that requires new political tools? Well, that's, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, the... the the situation hasn't moved at all in the right uh, in the right direction. Um, how much it's is how much it has calcified is is something to to be debated. Uh, we're trying. We would hope to try to arrange something with uh, the envoy and you uh, you guys in the next few days or or early early next week, so you have a chance to speak to her. And she still she remains in the region. Okay, uh, Maggie, and then Abdel Hamid. Steph, quick follow-up, please. Um, has Tor of Eneslam called uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu or uh, anyone Ms. from Mr. Mr. Carlo? I mean, has anyone yeah. spoken directly with the Prime Ms. Minister? Mr. Venislan has been in touch uh, with Israeli uh, decision makers at various uh, key and critical levels. Nobody has spoken directly. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into uh, the details of his contact. So I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying yes or no. Why is that like such a secret? You're because I think right. Very... Because right now, I think okay. right now the right now for us the focus is on the success of of his efforts uh, rather than detailing those efforts uh, in a play by play. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Steph. I want to follow up with the questions that James had raised, uh, the tool and Eddie, about the activities of the Secretary General, his special envoy, Mr. Winslow. So the SG so far he has not contacted any Israeli official. He's not prepared to go to the region. And Winsland uh, is engaged, but we don't know what kind of engagement. Specifically, can you give us a rundown of what he's doing, Mr. Bolivar? Did he leave his office? Abdel, 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 Abdel Hamid, I did not say that Mr. Vanislan was um, was going about his normal work. Uh, he is having deep and extensive 
contacts with all the key actors involved. Uh, and if you've asked me if he's left, I don't know, did you ask me what, if he's left his office? Yeah, if he left his office in Jerusalem. Uh, I, I have no doubt that he has stepped out of his office uh, to speak to various people. Okay, this is not, he, this is not normal. This is not normal times. I, I understand the, the need from your end to have as much of a detailed play-by-play, -play, but I, I'm not uh, able to go into that as I don't want to do anything that would jeopardize his, his, uh, his work. Uh, the other uh, thing is you just said that Honor was asked for $38 million uh, for emergency appeal. Is, as Secretary General, is, will, is, is he willing to also release some money from the emergency fund that he, Yes, we, we, uh, we, 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 we are working on that, and we hope to have an announcement on a SURF allocation uh, very soon. Yesterday, Steve, uh, you said that uh, Israel had not allowed some of the humanitarian shipment going into Gaza. Is there any development in that uh, area the, also? The crossings, uh, the crossings remain uh, closed. Uh, we very much that both the Erez and, um, and the Karim Shalom, which is the one used for goods, that those crossings are open uh, as quickly as, as possible. Uh, they were closed uh, yesterday while we were trying to get things in for, uh, for security reasons. Um, so the, the, the shipments, there were shipments of, um, of vaccines, first aid kits, aid kits food, uh, and other emergency medicine that was not able to get in. Okay, uh, James. You're being very cagey on one question you've been asked repeatedly, which is the contact that the Secretary General or anyone at the UN has had with the Israeli Prime Minister. I would argue it's important for us to know whether the man who's leading a military operation bombarding the people of Gaza is refusing to take the UN's calls. I, I understand your position. I'm not going to go uh, any further from my end. OK, a couple of other questions, then, if I can. Um, actually, I have one more. You, you've said that you're very much focusing on ending the conflict, and we understand mm -hmm. that. But clearly, it draws uh, attention to the wider issues of this conflict, right. which has been festering, and no one's been doing anything, and the Security Council has not mm -hmm. been doing anything mm -hmm. for a very long time. Um, I had an interesting Twitter exchange last week with the former French ambassador, Gerard Arrault, who yeah, said... Every, every Twitter exchange with Gerard Arrault is interesting. The two-state solution has been dead for some time, he told me. And then, talking about Security Council ambassadors, he said they have nothing else, so they pretend. Does the Secretary General believe the two-state solution is dead, that Israel's already built on top of the Palestinian think, state? Uh, or I mean, what, should there be some fresh thinking now? No one is ever against any fresh thinking. Um, but I think, as, as we've said, the, the longer this conflict goes on, the longer the underlying political issues are not solved, the more difficult it will get to that goal that we've always called for, which is two states, Israel and Palestine, living in peace side by side. Um, the, the, more we, the more time passes, the more difficult it will be to, to get to that goal. And if I may, I've had two other questions on other subjects, if you don't mind. Um, what, and, I, and I've not been listening to this briefing every single day for the last couple of weeks, but um, what is the latest on those talks that we were told were so important in Turkey on Afghanistan? Um, discussions are, the, the last we left it is that they would be held some point after Ramadan. Ramadan has passed, as you and I well know. Um, but I have nothing, the discussions are still uh, ongoing. And another one, and something happening later today, the Russian Foreign Minister and the US Secretary of State are meeting in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And the word is that is talk um, to try and prepare mm -hmm. for a summit between their two leaders mm -hmm. to permanent members of the Security Council who have very difficult relations. Um, how important does, does uh, the Secretary General th uh, see uh, a meeting bet between President Biden and President Putin? I mean, I, I think to have uh, for the United States and the Russian Federation uh, to have open dialogue and to have cooperation on so many of the critical issues that they have to deal with at the UN uh, would be a positive thing. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions, but I do see um, 
I do see Brendan. Oh, uh, Abdelhamid, did you want to ask something or you should say goodbye? Did the Secretary General express directly or indirectly any admiration of the heroic resistance of the Palestinian people resisting uh, an oppressive army which reminds us of the colonial power trying to subjugate an innocent people under, uh, under occupation uh, for over 54 years and Gaza under siege for over 13 years. Did he, did he see that picture of a, a, a resilient people I think what, what the Secretary General sees are civilians who are suffering uh, and proving resilient uh, in extremely difficult circumstances and people who deserve uh, to be helped and deserve to be helped by the international community. And we hope that they will through uh, funding to our humanitarian appeals. I take it you will Sir, stand. Can I, can I ask one more? Sure, go ahead, Toby. From Toby, and it's here. Thanks, sorry. Uh, this is sort of a strange question, but just to follow up on James on like on the political process, you know, I, Oslo Accords were before my time, and I don't really have a practical image in my head of how this kind of diplomacy, uh, you know, how the UN facilitates this kind of diplomacy. Like, what what would a you know a political dialogue facilitated by the UN to uh, create a a political process for reconciliation and the two-state solution, which is this theoretical concept that we always hear about. What what is that? What has that looked like in the past, and what would that look like now? I would uh, I would encourage you to buy a couple of books to look at what that looked like in the past. And I think there's a there's a movie there's a movie version of the Oslo play. It's coming out on HBO next week. Um, but and in all in all seriousness. Um, what we want to see, what we've always called for, are direct face-to-face -face discussions between the parties, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, to settle a number of these, um, these uh, final settlement uh, issues so we can get to what we want to see, what is based on UN resolutions, which is two states, Israel and Palestine, living side by side. And we, and I know a lot of other uh, actors, will do whatever it can to help bring that about. Thank you.